Here is a third way of seeing it. If the moral law was one of our instincts, we ought to be able to point to some one impulse inside us which was always what we call good, always in agreement with the rule of right behavior. But you cannot. There is none of our impulses which the moral law may not sometimes tell us to suppress, and none which it may not sometimes tell us to encourage. It is a mistake to think that some actions... If they are the foundation, I had better stop to make that foundation... Pay attention. Chapter 2. Some Objections. If they are the foundation, I had better stop to make that foundation firm before I go on. Especially Some of the letters I have had show that a good many people find it difficult to understand just what this law of human nature or moral law or rule of decent behavior is. For example, some people wrote to me saying, isn't what you call the moral law simply our herd instinct and hasn't it been developed just like all our other instincts? The last four Now, minutes. I do not deny that we may have a herd instinct, but that is not what I meant by the moral law. We all know what it feels like to be prompted by instinct, by mother love, or sexual instinct, or the instinct for food. It means that you feel a strong want or desire to act in a certain way. And, of course, we sometimes do feel just that sort of desire to help another person, and no doubt that desire is due to the herd instinct. But feeling a desire to help is quite different from feeling that you ought to help, whether you want to or not. Supposing you hear a cry for help from a man in danger. You will probably feel two desires. One, a desire to give help, due to your herd instinct. The other, a desire to keep out of danger, due to the instinct for self-preservation. But you will find inside you, in addition to these two impulses, a third thing which tells you that you ought to follow the impulse to help and suppress the impulse to run away. Now this thing that judges between two instincts, that decides which should be encouraged, cannot itself be either of them. You might as well say that the sheet of music which tells you at a given moment to play one note on the piano and not another is itself one of the notes on the keyboard. The moral law tells us the tune we have to play. Our instincts are merely the keys. Another way of seeing that the moral law is not simply one of our instincts is this. If two instincts are in conflict, and there is nothing in a creature's mind except those two instincts, obviously the stronger of the two must win. But at those moments when we are most conscious of the moral law, it usually seems to be telling us to side with the weaker of the two impulses. You probably want to be safe much more than you want to help the man who is drowning, but the moral law tells you to help him all the same. And surely it often tells us to try to make the right impulse stronger than it naturally is? I mean, we often feel it our duty to stimulate the herd instinct by waking up our imaginations and arousing our pity and so on, so as to get up enough steam for doing the right thing. But clearly we are not acting from instinct when we set about making an instinct stronger than it is. The thing that says to you, your herd instinct is asleep, wake it up, cannot itself be the herd instinct. The thing that tells you which note on the piano needs to be played louder cannot itself be that note. Here is a third way of seeing it. If the moral law was one of our instincts, we ought to be able to point to some one impulse inside us which was always what we call good, always in agreement with the rule of right behavior. But you cannot. There is none of our impulses which the moral law may not sometimes tell us to suppress, and none which it may not sometimes tell us to encourage. It is a mistake to think that some of our impulses, say mother love or patriotism, are good, and others, like sex or the fighting instinct, are bad. All we mean is that the occasions on which the fighting instinct or the sexual desire need to be restrained are rather more frequent than those for restraining mother love or patriotism. But there are situations when it is the duty of a married man to encourage his sexual impulse, and of a soldier to encourage the fighting instinct. There are also occasions on which a mother's love for her own children or a man's love for his own country have to be suppressed, or they will lead to unfairness towards other people's children or countries. Strictly speaking, there are no such things as good and bad impulses. Think once again of a piano. It has not got two kinds of notes on it, the right notes and the wrong ones. <laughs> Every single note is right at one time and wrong at another. The moral law is not any one instinct or any set of instincts. It is something which makes a kind of tune. 
the tune that we call goodness or right conduct by directing the instincts. By the way, this point is of great practical consequence. The most dangerous thing you can do is to take any one impulse of your own nature and set it up as the thing you ought to follow at all costs. There is not one of them which will not make us into devils if we set it up as an absolute guide. You might think love of humanity in general was safe, but it is not. If you leave out justice, you will find yourself breaking agreements and faking evidence in trials for the sake of humanity, and become in the end a cruel and treacherous man. Huh. Other people wrote to me saying, isn't what you call the moral law just a social convention, something that is put into us by education? I think there is a misunderstanding here. The people who ask that question are usually taking it for granted that if we have learned a thing from parents and teachers, then that thing must be merely a human invention. But of course, that is not so. We all learned the multiplication table at school. A child who grew up alone on a desert island would not know it. But surely it does not follow that the multiplication table is simply a human convention, something human beings have made up for themselves and might have made different if they had liked. I fully agree that we learn the rule of decent behavior from parents and teachers and friends and books as we learn everything else. But some of the things we learn are mere conventions, which might have been different. We learn to keep to the left of the road, but it might just as well have been the rule to keep to the right. And others of them, like mathematics, are real truths. The question is to which class the law of human nature belongs. There are two reasons for saying it belongs to the same class as mathematics. The first is, as I said in the first chapter, that though there are differences between the moral ideas of one time or country and those of another, the differences are not really very great, not nearly so great as most people imagine. And you can recognize the same law running through them all. Whereas mere conventions, like the rule of the road or the kind of clothes people wear, may differ to any extent. The other reason is this. When you think about these differences between the morality of one people and another, do you think that the morality of one people is ever better or worse than that of another? Have any of the changes been improvements? If not, then of course there could never be any moral progress. Progress means not just changing, but changing for the better. If no set of moral ideas were truer or better than any other, there would be no sense in preferring civilized morality to savage morality, or Christian morality to Nazi morality. In fact, of course, we all do believe that some moralities are better than others. We do believe that some of the people who tried to change the moral ideas of their own age were what we would call reformers or pioneers, people who understood morality better than their neighbors did. Very well, then. The moment you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are in fact measuring them both by a standard, saying that one of them conforms to that standard more nearly than the other. But the standard that measures two things is something different from either. You are in fact comparing them both with some real morality, admitting that there is such a thing as a real right, independent of what people think, and that some people's ideas get nearer to that real right than others. Or put it this way, if your moral ideas can be truer and those of the Nazis less true, there must be something, some real morality, for them to be true about. The reason why your idea of New York can be truer or less true than mine is that New York is a real place, existing quite apart from what either of us thinks. If, when each of us said New York, each meant merely the town I am imagining in my own head, how could one of us have truer ideas than the other? there would be no question of truth or falsehood at all. In the same way, if the rule of decent behavior meant simply whatever each nation happens to approve, there would be no sense in saying that any one nation had ever been more correct in its approval than any other. No sense in saying that the world could ever grow morally better or morally worse. I conclude then that though the differences between people's ideas of decent behavior often make you suspect that there is no real natural law of behavior at all, Yet the things we are bound to think about these differences really prove just the opposite. But one word before I end. I have met people who exaggerate the differences because they have not distinguished between differences of morality and differences of belief about facts. For example, one man said to me, 300 years ago people in England were putting witches to death. Was that what you call the rule of human nature or right conduct? But surely the reason we do not execute witches is that we do not believe there are such things. If we did, 
If we really thought that there were people going about who had sold themselves to the devil and received supernatural powers from him in return, and were using these powers to kill their neighbors or drive them mad or bring bad weather, surely we would all agree that if anyone deserved the death penalty, then these filthy quizlings did. There is no difference of moral principle here. The difference is simply about matter of fact. It may be a great advance in knowledge not to believe in witches. There is no moral advance in not executing them when you do not think they are there. You would not call a man humane for ceasing to set mouse traps if he did so because he believed there were no mice in the house. Miracles by C.S. Lewis. This book bears a dedication to Cecil and Daphne Harwood. Among the hills a meteorite lies huge, and moss has overgrown, and wind and rain with touches light made soft the contours of the stone. Thus easily can earth digest a cinder of sidereal fire, and make her translunary guest the native of an English shire. Nor is it strange these wanderers find in her lap their fitting place, for every particle that's hers came at the first from outer space. All that is earth has once been sky. Down from the sun of old she came, or from some star that travelled by too close to his entangling flame. Hence, if belated drops yet fall from heaven, on these her plastic power still works as once it worked on all the glad rush of the golden shower. C.S.L. Reprinted by permission of Time and Tide. Electric Universe, what? One. The scope of this book. Those who wish to succeed must ask the right preliminary questions. Aristotle, Metaphysics 2, 3, 1. In all my life, I have met only one person who claims to have seen a ghost. And the interesting thing about the story is that that person disbelieved in the immortal soul before she saw the ghost, and still disbelieves after seeing it. She says that what she saw must have been an illusion or a trick of the nerves, and obviously she may be right. Seeing is not believing. For this reason, the question whether miracles occur can never be answered simply by experience. Every event which might claim to be a miracle is, in the last resort, something presented to our senses, something seen, heard, touched, smelled, or tasted, and our senses are infallible. If anything extraordinary seems to have happened, we can always say that we have been the victims of an illusion. If we hold a philosophy which excludes the supernatural, this is what we always shall say. What we learn from experience depends on the kind of philosophy we bring to experience. It is therefore useless to appeal to experience before we have settled, as well as we can, the philosophical question. If immediate experience cannot prove or disprove the miraculous, still less can history do so. Many people think one can decide whether a miracle occurred in the past by examining the evidence according to the ordinary rules of historical inquiry. But the ordinary rules cannot be worked until we have decided whether miracles are possible, and if so, how probable they are. For if they are impossible, then no amount of historical evidence will convince us. If they are possible, but immensely improbable, then only mathematically demonstrative evidence will convince us. And since history never provides that degree of evidence for any event, history can never convince us that a miracle occurred. If, on the other hand, miracles are not intrinsically improbable, then the existing evidence will be sufficient to convince us that quite a number of miracles have occurred. The result of our historical inquiries thus depends on the philosophical views which we have been holding before we even begin to look at the evidence. This philosophical question must therefore come first. 
Here is an example of the sort of thing that happens if we omit the preliminary philosophical task and rush on to the historical. In a popular commentary on the Bible, you will find a discussion of the date at which the fourth gospel was written. The author says it must have been written after the execution of St. Peter, because in the fourth gospel, Christ is represented as predicting the execution of St. Peter. A book, thinks the author, cannot be written before events which it refers to. Of course it cannot, unless real predictions ever occur. If they do, then this argument for the date is in ruins. And the author has not discussed at all whether real predictions are possible. He takes it for granted, perhaps unconsciously, that they are not. Perhaps he is right. But if he is, he has not discovered this principle by historical inquiry. He has brought his disbelief in predictions to his historical work, so to speak, ready-made. Unless he had done so, his historical conclusion about the date of the fourth gospel could not have been reached at all. His work is therefore quite useless to a person who wants to know whether predictions occur. The author gets to work only after he has already answered that question in the negative, and on grounds which he never communicates to us. This book is intended as a preliminary to historical inquiry. I am not a trained historian, and I shall not examine the historical evidence for the Christian miracles. My effort is to put my readers in a position to do so. It is no use going to the texts until we have some that idea really about the possibility important. or probability of the miraculous. Those who assume that miracles cannot happen are merely wasting their time by looking into the texts. We know in advance what results they will find, for they have begun by begging the question. 2. The Naturalist and the Supernaturalist Gracious! exclaimed Mrs. Snip. And is there a place where people venture to live above ground? I never heard of people living underground, replied Tim, before I came to Giant Land. Came to Giant Land? cried Mrs. Snip. Why, isn't everywhere Giant Land? Roland Quiz, Giant Land, Chapter 32. I use the word miracle to mean an interference with nature by supernatural power. Unless there exists, in addition to nature, something else which we may call the supernatural, there can be no miracles. Some people believe that nothing exists except nature. I call these people naturalists. Others think that besides nature there exists something else. I call them supernaturalists. responding to nothing objective and serving no biological function, did not live up to my own principles. The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis This book bears a dedication to The Inklings. The Son of God suffered unto the death, not that men might not suffer, but that their sufferings might be like his. George MacDonald, Unspoken Sermons, First Series Preface When Mr. Ashley Sampson suggested to me the writing of this book, I asked leave to be allowed to write it anonymously, since, if I were to say what I really thought about pain... I should be forced to make statements of such apparent fortitude that they would become ridiculous if anyone knew who made them. Anonymity was rejected as inconsistent with the series, but Mr. Sampson pointed out that I could write a preface explaining that I did not live up to my own principles. <laughs> this exhilarating program I am now carrying out. Let me confess at once, in the words of good Walter Hilton, that throughout this book... I feel myself so far from true feeling of that I speak that I can naught else but cry mercy and desire after it as I may. Yet for that very reason there is one criticism which cannot be brought against me. No one can say, he jests at scars who never felt a wound, for I have never for one moment been in a state of mind to which even the imagination of serious pain was less than intolerable. If any man is safe from the danger of underestimating this adversary, I am that man. I must add, too, that the only purpose of the book is to solve the intellectual problem raised by suffering, 
For the far higher task of teaching fortitude and patience, I was never fool enough to suppose myself qualified, nor have I anything to offer my readers except my conviction that when pain is to be borne, a little courage helps more than much knowledge, a little human sympathy more than much courage, and the least tincture of the love of God more than all. Amen. If any real theologian reads these pages, he will very easily see that they are the work of a layman and an amateur. Except in the last two chapters, parts of which are admittedly speculative, I have believed myself to be restating ancient and orthodox doctrines. If any parts of the book are original, in the sense of being novel or unorthodox, they are so against my will and as a result of my ignorance. I write, of course, as a layman of the Church of England. But I have tried to assume nothing that is not professed by all baptized and communicating Christians. Compromised. As this is not a work of erudition, I have taken little pains to trace ideas or quotations to their sources when they were not easily recoverable. Any theologian will see easily enough what and how little I have read. C.S. Lewis, Magdalen College, Oxford, 1940. One. Introductory. I wonder at the hardihood with which such persons undertake to talk about God. In a treatise addressed to infidels, they begin with a chapter proving the existence of God from the works of nature. This only gives their readers grounds for thinking that the proofs of our religion are very weak. It is a remarkable fact that no canonical writer has ever used nature to prove God. Pascal, Pensee, 4, 242, 243. Not many years ago, when I was an atheist, if anyone had asked me, why do you not believe in God, my reply would have run something like this. Look at the universe we live in. By far the greatest part of it consists of empty space, completely dark and unimaginably cold. And the bodies which move in this space are so few and so small in comparison with the space itself that even if every one of them were known to be crowded as full as it could hold with perfectly happy creatures, it would still be difficult to believe that life and happiness were more than a byproduct to the power that made the universe. As it is, however, the scientists think it likely that very few of the suns of space, perhaps none of them except our own, have any planets. And in our own system it is improbable that any planet except the Earth sustains life. And Earth herself existed without life for millions of years, and may exist for millions more when life has left her. And what is it like while it lasts? It is so arranged that all the forms of it can live only by preying upon one another. In the lower forms, this process entails only death. But in the higher, there appears a new quality called consciousness, which enables it to be attended with pain. The creatures cause pain by being born, and live by inflicting pain, and in pain they mostly die. In the most complex of all the creatures, man, yet another quality appears, which we call reason whereby he is enabled to foresee his own pain, which henceforth is preceded with acute mental mm. suffering, and to foresee his own death, while keenly desiring permanence. It also enables men, by a hundred ingenious contrivances, to inflict a great deal more pain than they otherwise could have done on one another and on the irrational creatures. <laughs> this power they have exploited to the full. Their history is largely a record of crime, war, disease, and terror, with just sufficient happiness interposed to give them, while it lasts, an agonized apprehension of losing it, and when it is lost, the poignant misery of remembering. Every now and then they improve their condition a little, and what we call a civilization appears. But all civilizations pass away, and even while they remain, inflict peculiar sufferings of their own, probably sufficient to outweigh what alleviations they may have brought to the normal pains of man. That our own civilization has done so, no one will dispute. That it will pass away, like all its predecessors, is surely probable. Even if it should not, what then? The race is doomed. Every race that comes into being in any part of the universe is doomed. For the universe, they tell us, is running down and will sometime be a uniform infinity of homogeneous matter at a low part. temperature. They tell All us. stories will come to nothing. All life will turn out in the end to have been a transitory and senseless contortion upon the idiotic face of infinite matter. If you ask me to believe that this is the work of a benevolent and omnipotent spirit, I reply that all the evidence points in the opposite direction. 
Either there is no spirit behind the universe, or else a spirit indifferent to good and evil, or else an evil spirit. There was one question which I never dreamed of raising. I never noticed that the very strength and facility of the pessimist's case at once poses us a problem. If the universe is so bad, or even half so bad, how on earth did human beings ever come to attribute it to the activity of a wise and good creator? Men are fools, perhaps, but hardly so foolish as that. The direct inference from black to white, from evil flower to virtuous root, from senseless work to a workman infinitely wise, staggers belief. The spectacle of the universe as revealed by experience can never be the ground of religion. It must always have been something in spite of which religion, acquired from a different source, was held. It would be an error to reply that our ancestors were ignorant, and therefore entertained pleasing illusions about nature which the progress of science has since dispelled. For centuries, <laughs> during which all men believed, the nightmare size and emptiness of the universe was already known. You will read in some books that the men of the Middle Ages thought the earth flat, and the stars near, but that is a lie. Ptolemy had told them that the Earth was a mathematical point without size in relation to the distance of the fixed stars, a distance which one medieval popular text estimates as 117 million miles. And in times yet earlier, even from the beginnings, men must have got the same sense of hostile immensity from a more obvious source. To prehistoric man, miles, the neighboring forest must have been infinite enough, and the utterly alien and infest which we have to fetch from the thought of cosmic rays and cooling suns came snuffing and howling nightly to his very doors. Certainly at all periods the pain and waste of human life was equally obvious. Our own religion begins among the Jews, a people... What we would here and now call our happiness is not the end God chiefly has in view, but when we are such as he can love without impediment, we shall in fact be happy. I plainly foresee that the course of my argument may provoke a protest. I had promised that in coming to understand the divine goodness, we should not be asked not to accept a mere reversal of our own ethics. <laughs> But it may be objected that a reversal is precisely what we have been asked to accept. <clears throat> the kind of love which I attribute to God, it may be said, is just the kind which in human beings we describe as selfish or possessive, and contrast unfavorably with another kind which seeks first the happiness of the beloved and not the contentment of the lover. I am not sure that this is quite how I feel even about human love, I do not think I should value much the love of a friend who cared only for my happiness and did not object to my becoming dishonest. Nevertheless, the protest is welcome, and the answer to it will put the subject in a new light and correct what has been one-sided in our discussion. The truth is that this antithesis between egoistic and altruistic love cannot be unambiguously applied mm. to the love of God for his creatures. Clashes of interest, and therefore opportunities either of selfishness or unselfishness, occur only between beings inhabiting a common world. God can no more be in competition with a creature than Shakespeare can be in competition with Viola. When God becomes a man, and lives as a creature among his own creatures in Palestine, then indeed his life is one of supreme self-sacrifice, and leads to Calvary. A modern pantheistic philosopher has said, when the absolute falls into the sea, it becomes a fish. In the same way, we Christians can point to the Incarnation and say that when God empties himself of his glory and submits to those conditions under which alone egoism and altruism have a clear meaning, he Amen. is seen to be wholly Amen. altruistic. But God in his transcendence, God as the unconditioned ground of all conditions, cannot easily be thought of in the same way. We call human love selfish when it satisfies its own needs at the expense of the object's needs, as when a father keeps at home, because he cannot bear to relinquish their society, children who ought, in their own interests, to be put out into the world. <laughs> the situation implies a need or passion on the part of the lover, an incompatible Backwind. need on the part of the beloved, and the, the lover's disregard or culpable <clears throat> ignorance of the beloved's need. Available. None of these conditions is present in the relation of God to man. God has no needs. Human love, as Plato teaches us, is the child of poverty, of a want or lack, 
It is caused by a real or supposed good in its beloved which the lover needs and desires. But God's love, far from being caused by goodness in the object, causes all the goodness which the object has, loving it first into existence and then into real, though derivative, lovability. God is goodness. He can give good but cannot need or get it. In that sense, all his love is, as it were, bottomlessly selfless by very definition. It has everything to give and nothing to receive. Hence, if God sometimes speaks as though the impassable could suffer passion and eternal fullness could be in want, and in want of those beings on whom it bestows all from their bare existence upwards, this can mean only, if it means anything intelligible by us, that God of mere miracle has made himself able so to hunger and created in himself that which we can satisfy. If he requires us, the requirement is of his own choosing. If the immutable heart can be grieved by the puppets of its own making, it is divine omnipotence, no other, that has so subjected it freely and in a humility that passes understanding. If the world exists not chiefly that we may love God, but that God may love us, yet that very fact, on a deeper level, is so for our sakes. If he who in himself can lack nothing chooses to need us, it is because we need to be needed. Before and behind all the relations of God to man, as we now learn them from Christianity, yawns the abyss of a divine act of pure giving, the election of man from non-entity to be the beloved of God, and therefore, in some sense, the needed and desired of God, who but for that act needs and desires nothing, since he eternally has and oh, is boy. all goodness. And that act is for our sakes. It is good for us to know love, and best for us to know the love of the best object, God. But to know it as a love in which we were primarily the wooers, and God the wooed, in which we sought and he was found, in which his conformity to our needs, not ours to his, came first, would be to know it in a form false to the very nature of things. For we are only creatures. Our role must always be that of patient to agent, female to male, mirror to light, echo to voice. Our highest activity must be a response, not initiative. To experience the love of God in a true and not an illusory form is therefore to experience it as our surrender to his demand, our conformity to his desire. To experience it in the opposite way is, as it were, a solecism against the grammar of being. I do not deny, of course, that on a certain level we may rightly speak of the soul's search for God, and of God as receptive of the soul's love. But in the long run, the soul's search for God can only be a mode or appearance, Erscheinung, of his search for her, since all comes from him, since the very possibility of our loving is his gift to us, and since our freedom is only a freedom of better or worse response. Hence, I think that nothing marks off pagan theism from Christianity so sharply as Aristotle's doctrine that God moves the universe, himself unmoving, as the beloved moves a lover. But for Christendom, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. The first condition, then, of what is called a selfish love among men is lacking with God. He has no natural necessities, no passion to compete with his wish for the beloved's welfare. Or if there is in him something which we have to imagine after the analogy of a passion, she of dolly. Love, it is there by his own will and for our sakes. And the second condition is lacking too. The real interests of a child may differ from that which his father's affection instinctively demands, because the child is a separate being from the father with a nature which has its own needs and does not exist solely for the father nor find its whole perfection in being loved by him, and which the father does not fully understand. But creatures are not thus separate from their creator, nor can he misunderstand them. The place for which he designs them in his schemes of things is the place they are made for. When they reach it, their nature is fulfilled and their happiness attained. A broken bone in the universe has been set. The anguish is over. When we want to be something other than the thing God wants us to be, we must be wanting what, in fact, will not make us happy. Those divine demands which sound to our natural ears Four, most three, like those of a two, despot and one. least like those of... But he is a bully, a coward, a tale-bearer, and a liar. But nonetheless, <clears throat> however it came there, 
His present character is detestable. They not only hate it, but ought to hate it. They cannot love him for what he is. They can only try to turn him into what he is not. In the meantime, though the boy is most unfortunate in having been so brought up, you cannot quite call his character a misfortune if he were one thing and his character another. It is he, he himself, who bullies and sneaks and likes doing it. And if he begins to mend, he will inevitably feel shame and guilt at what he is just beginning to cease to be. With this I have said all that can be said on the level at which alone I feel able to treat the subject of the fall. But I warn my readers once more that this level is a shallow one. We have said nothing about the trees of life and of knowledge, which doubtless conceal some great mystery. And we have said nothing about the Pauline statement that, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. It is this passage which lies behind the patristic doctrine of our physical presence in Adam's loins and Anselm's doctrine of our inclusion by legal fiction in the suffering Christ. These theories may have done good in their day, but they do no good to me, and I am not going to invent others. We have recently been told by the scientists that we have no right to expect that the real universe should be picturable, and that if we make Those mental scientists. pictures to illustrate <laughs> quantum physics, we are moving further away from reality, not nearer to it. Quantum physics we have clearly even less right to demand reality. that the highest spiritual reality... That's 1947. Just he saw that in the rolling of the mist above him, something Just else would roll. Like John had a little sling, and he went out into the garden, and he saw a bird sitting on a branch. A pleasure of her in the body, though it often ended that way. Sometimes he would talk to her about himself, telling her lies about his courage. It is like this. Ah, but it doesn't need any note. A big card with small print all over it, and said, Here is a list of... As cold waters to a thirsty soul, this, so is good news uh, from a far finally, country. Finally, Proverbs is my favorite book. Book one, the, the data. Pilgrims regress. This every soul seeketh, and for the sake of this C. doth all her actions, S. having an inkling Lewis. that it is, but what it is she cannot sufficiently discern, and she knoweth not her way, and concerning this she hath no constant assurance as she hath of other things. Plato. Move. Whose souls, albeit in a cloudy memory, yet seek back their good, but, like drunk men, know oh not the road home. Boethius. Oh my goodness, we're going to go for a walk. Somewhat it seeketh, and what that is directly it knoweth not. Yet very intentive desire thereof doth so incite it that all mm. other known delights and pleasures are laid aside. They give place to the search of this, but only suspected desire. Hooker. One. Oh, the yes. rules. Yes, you are. I dreamed of a boy who was born in the land of Puritania, and his name was John. And I dreamed that when John was able to walk, he ran out of his parents' garden on a fine morning onto the road. And on the other side of the road there was a deep wood, oh, but not thick, here, huh? full of primroses and soft green moss. When John set eyes on this, he thought he had never seen anything so beautiful, and he ran across the road and into the wood and was just about to go down on his hands and knees and to pull up the primroses by handfuls when his mother came running out of the garden gate, and she also ran across the road and caught John up and smacked him soundly and told him he must never go into the wood again. And John cried, but he asked no questions, for he was not yet at the age for asking questions. Then a year went past, and then another fine morning, John had a little sling, and he went out into the garden, and he saw a bird sitting on a branch. And John got his sling ready and was going to have a shot at the bird when the cook came running out of the garden and caught John up and smacked him soundly and told him he must never kill any of the birds in the garden. Why, said John. Because the steward would be very angry, said Cook. Who is the steward, said John. He is the man who makes rules for all the country round here, said Cook. Why, said John. Because the landlord set him to do it. Who is the landlord? said John. He owns all the country, said the cook. Why? said John. And when he asked this, the cook went and told his mother. And his mother sat down and talked to John about the landlord all afternoon. But John took none of it in, for he was not yet at the age for taking it in. 
Then a year went past, and one dark, cold, wet morning, John was made to put on new clothes. They were the ugliest clothes that had ever been put upon him, which John did not mind at all, but they also caught him under the chin, and were tight under the arms, which he minded a great deal, and they made him itch all over. And his father and mother took him out along the road, one holding him by each hand, which was uncomfortable too, and very unnecessary, and told him they were taking him to see the steward. The steward lived in a big dark house of stone on the side of the road. The father and mother went in to talk to the steward first, and John was left sitting in the hall on a chair so high that his feet did not reach the floor. There were other chairs in the hall where he could have sat in comfort, but his father had told him that the steward would be angry if he did not sit absolutely still and be very good, and John was beginning to be afraid. So he sat still in the high chair with his feet dangling and his clothes itching all over him and his eyes starting out of his head. After a very long time, his parents came back again, looking as if they had been with the doctor, very grave. Then they said that John must go in and see the steward too. And when John came into the room, there was an old man with a red, round face who was very kind and full of jokes, so that John quite got over his fears. And they had a good talk about fishing tackle and bicycles. But just when the talk was at its best, the steward got up and cleared his throat. He then took down a mask from the wall with a long white beard attached to it and suddenly clapped it on his face so that his appearance was awful. And he said, Now I'm going to talk to you about the landlord. The landlord owns all the country and it is very, very kind of him to allow us to live on in it at all. Very, very kind. Pay attention to the landlord. He went on repeating, very kind, in a queer sing-song voice so long that John would have laughed but that now he was beginning to be frightened again. The steward then took down from a peg a big card with small print all over it and said, Here is a list of all the things the landlord says you must not do. You'd better look at it. So John took the card, but half the rules seemed to forbid things he had never heard of, and the other half forbade things he was doing every day and could not imagine not doing. And the number of the rules was so enormous that he I'm felt he could go never remember I'm going to go buy a bone for my dog. I hope, said the steward, that you have not already broken any of the rules. John's heart began to thump, and his eyes bulged more and more, and he was at his wit's end when the steward took the mask off and looked at John with his real face and said, Better tell a lie, old chap. Better tell a lie. Easiest for all concerned. And popped the mask on his face all in a flash. John gulped and said quickly, Oh, no, sir. That is just as well said the steward through the mask, because, you know, if you did break any of them and the landlord got to know of it, do you know what he'd do to you? No, sir, said John. And the steward's eyes seemed to be twinkling dreadfully through the holes of the mask. He'd take you and shut you up forever and ever in a black hole full of snakes and scorpions as large as lobsters, forever and ever. And besides that, he is such a kind, good man, so very, very kind, that I am sure you would never want to displease him. No, sir, said John, but please, sir. Well, said the steward, please, sir, supposing I did break one, one little one, just by accident, you know, could nothing stop the snakes and lobsters? Ah, said the steward. And then he sat down and talked for a long time, but John could not understand a single syllable. However, it all ended with pointing out that the landlord was quite extraordinarily kind and good to his tenants, and would certainly torture most of them to death the moment he had the slightest pretext. And you can't blame him, said the steward, for after all, it is his land, and it is so very good of him to let us live here at all, people like us, you know. Then the steward took off the mask and had a nice, sensible chat with John again and gave him a cake and brought him out to his father and mother. But just as they were going, he bent down and whispered in John's ear, I shouldn't bother about it all too much if I were you. At the same time, he slipped the card of rules into John's hand and told him he could keep it for his own use. Two. The Island. Now the days and the weeks went on again, and I dreamed that John had little peace either by day or night for thinking of the rules and the black hole full of snakes. At first he tried very hard to keep them all, 
But when it came to bedtime, he always found that he had broken far more than he had kept. And the thought of the horrible tortures to which the good, kind landlord would put him came such a burden that next day he would become quite reckless and break as many as he possibly could. For oddly enough, this eased his mind for the moment. But then, after a few days, the fear would return, and this time it would be worse than before because of the dreadful number of rules that he had broken during the interval. But what puzzled him most at this time was a discovery which he made after the rules had been hanging in his bedroom for two or three nights. Namely, that on the other side of the card, on the back, there was quite a different set of rules. There were so many that he never read them all through, and he was always finding new ones. Some of them were very like the rules on the front of the card, but most of them were just the opposite. Thus, whereas the front of the card said that you must be always examining yourself to see how many rules you had broken, the back of the card began like this. Rule one. Put the whole thing out of your head the moment you get into bed. Or again, whereas the front said that you must always go and ask your elders what the rule about a certain thing was, if you were in the least doubt, the back said, Rule two. Unless they saw you do it, keep quiet or else you'll rue it. And so on. And now I dreamed that John went out one morning and tried to play in the road and to forget his troubles. But the rules kept coming back into his head so that he did not make much of it. However, he went on always a few yards further till suddenly he looked up and saw that he was so far away from home that he was in a part of the road he had never seen before. Then came the sound of a musical instrument. From behind, it seemed, very sweet and very short, as if it were one plucking of a string or one note of a bell, and after it a full, clear voice. And it sounded so high and strange that he thought it was very far away, further than a star. The voice said, Come. Then John saw that there was a stone wall beside the road in that part, but it had, what he had never seen in a garden wall before, a window. There was no glass in the window and no bars. It was just a square hole in the wall. Through it he saw a green wood full of primroses, and he remembered suddenly how he had gone into another wood to pull primroses as a child very long ago, so long that even in the moment of remembering the memory seemed still out of reach. While he strained to grasp it, there came to him from beyond the wood a sweetness and a pang so piercing that instantly he forgot his father's house and his mother and the fear of the landlord and the burden of the rules. All the furniture of his mind was taken away. A moment later he found that he was sobbing and the sun had gone in and what it was that had happened to him he could not quite remember nor whether it had happened in this wood or in the other wood when he was a child. It seemed to him that a mist which hung at the far end of the wood had parted for a moment, and through the rift he had seen a calm sea, and in the sea an island where the smooth turf sloped down unbroken to the bays, and out of the thickets peeped the pale, small-breasted oreads, wise like gods, unconscious of themselves like beasts, and tall enchanters, bearded to their feet, sat in green chairs among the forests. But even while he pictured these things, he knew, with one part of his mind, that they were not like the things he had seen. Nay, that what had befallen him was not seeing at all. But he was too young to heed the distinction, and too empty, now that the unbounded sweetness passed away, not to seize greedily whatever it had left behind. He had no inclination yet to go into the wood, and presently he went home with a sad excitement upon him, repeating to himself a thousand times, I know now what I want. The first time that he said it, he was aware that it was not entirely true, but before he went to bed, he was believing it. 3. The Eastern Mountains John had a disreputable old uncle who was the tenant of a poor little farm beside his father's. One day, when John came in from the garden, he found a great hubbub in the house. His uncle was sitting there with his cheeks the color of ashes. His mother was crying. His father was sitting very still, with a solemn face, and there in the midst of them was the steward with his mask on. John crept round to his mother and asked her what the matter was. Poor Uncle George has had notice to quit, she said. Why, said John, his lease is up. The landlord has sent him notice to quit. But didn't you know how long the lease was for? Oh, no, indeed we did not. We thought it was for years and years more. I'm sure the landlord never gave us any idea he was going to turn him out at a moment's notice like this. 
Ah, but it doesn't need any notice, broke in the steward. You know, he always retains the right to turn anyone out whenever he chooses. It is very good of him to let any of us stay here at all. To be sure, to be sure, said the mother. That goes without saying, said the father. I'm not complaining, said Uncle George, but it seems cruelly hard. Not at all, said the steward. You've only got to go to the castle and knock at the gate and see the landlord himself. You know that he's only turning you out of here to make you much more comfortable somewhere else, don't you? Uncle George nodded. He did not seem able to get his voice. Suddenly the father looked at his watch. Then he looked up at the steward and said, Well, yes, said the steward. Then John was sent up to his bedroom and told to put on the ugly and uncomfortable clothes. And when he came downstairs, itching all over and tight under the arms, he was given a little mask to put on, and his parents put masks on too. Then I thought in my dream that they wanted to put a mask on Uncle George, but he was trembling so that it would not stay on. So they had to see his face as it was. And his face became so dreadful that everyone looked in a different direction and pretended not to see it. They got Uncle George to his feet with much difficulty, and then they all came out onto the road. The sun was just setting at one end of the road, for the road ran east and west. They turned their backs on the dazzling western sky, and there John saw ahead of them the night coming down over the eastern mountains. The country sloped down eastward to a brook, and all this side of the brook was green and cultivated. On the other side of the brook a great black moor sloped upward, and beyond that were the crags and chasms of the lower mountains and high above them again the bigger mountains, and on top of the whole waste was one mountain so big and black that John was afraid of it. He was told that the landlord had his castle up there. They trudged on eastward, a long time, always descending, till they came to the brook. They were so low that the sunset behind them was out of sight. Before them all was growing darker every minute, and the cold east wind was blowing out of the darkness right from the mountain tops. When they had stood for a little, Uncle George looked round on them all once or twice and said, Oh, dear. Oh, dear. In a funny, small voice, like a child's. Then he stepped over the brook and began to walk away up the moor. It was now so dark, and there were so many ups and downs in the moorland, that they lost sight of him almost at once. Nobody ever saw him again. Well, said the steward, untying his mask as they turned homeward, We've all got to go when our time comes. That's true, said the father, who was lighting his pipe. When it was lit, he turned to the steward and said, Some of those pigs of George's have won prizes. I'd keep them if I were you, said the steward. It's no time for selling now. Perhaps you're right, said the father. John walked behind with his mother. Mother? Well, dear, could any of us be turned out without notice like that any day? Well, yes. But it is very unlikely. But we might be. You oughtn't to be thinking of that sort of thing at your age. Why oughtn't I? It's not healthy, a boy like you. Mother? Yes? Can we break off the lease without notice, too? How do you mean? Well, the landlord can turn us out of the farm whenever he likes. Can we leave the farm whenever we like? No, certainly not. Why not? That's in the lease. We must go when he likes and stay as long as he likes. Why? I suppose because he makes the leases. What would happen if we did leave? He would be very angry. Would he put us in the black hole? Perhaps. Mother. Well, dear, will the landlord put Uncle George in the black hole? How dare you say such a thing about your poor uncle? Of course he won't. But hasn't Uncle George broken all the rules? Broken all the rules? Your Uncle George was a very good man. You never told me that before, said John. 4. Leah for Rachel Then I turned over in my sleep and began to dream deeper still, and I dreamed that I saw John growing tall and lank till he ceased to be a child and became a boy. The chief pleasure of his life in these days was to go down the road and look through the window in the wall in the hope of seeing the beautiful island. Some days he saw it well enough, especially at first, and heard the music and the voice. 
At first he would not look through the window into the wood unless he had heard the music, but after a time both the sight of the island and the sounds became very rare. He would stand looking through the window for hours and seeing the wood, but no sea or island beyond it, and straining his ears but hearing nothing except the wind in the leaves. And the yearning for that sight of the island and the sweet wind blowing over the water from it, though indeed these themselves had given him only yearning, became so terrible that John thought he would die if he did not have them again soon. He even said to himself, I would break every rule on the card for them if I could only get them. I would go down to the black hole forever if it had a window from which I could see the island. Then it came into his head that perhaps he ought to explore the wood, and thus he might find his way down to the sea beyond it. So he determined that the next day, whatever he saw or heard at the window, he would go through and spend the whole day in the wood. When the morning came, it had been raining all night, and a south wind had blown the clouds away at sunrise, and all was fresh and shining. As soon as he had had his breakfast, John was out on the road. With the wind and the birds and country carts passing, there were many noises about that morning, so that when John heard a strain of music long before he had reached the wall and the window, a strain like that which he desired, but coming from an unexpected quarter, he could not be absolutely certain that he had not imagined it. It made him stand still in the road for a minute, and in my dream I could hear him thinking, like this, If I go after that sound, away off the road up yonder, it is all luck whether I shall find anything at all. But if I go to the window, there I know I shall reach the wood, and there I can have a good hunt for the shore and the island. In fact, I shall insist on finding it. I am determined to. But if I go a new way, I shall not be able to insist. I shall just have to take what comes. So he went on to the place he knew, and climbed through the window into the wood. Up and down and to and fro among the trees he walked, looking this way and that. But he found no sea and no shore, and indeed no end to the wood in any direction. When it came to the middle of the day, he was so hot that he sat down and fanned himself, Often of late, when the sight of the island had been withheld, he had felt sad and despairing. But what he felt now was more like anger. I must have it, he kept on saying to himself, and then, I must have something. Then it occurred to him that at least he had the wood, which he would once have loved, and that he had not given it a thought all morning. Very well, thought John, I will enjoy the wood. I will enjoy it. He set his teeth and wrinkled his forehead, and sat still until the sweat rolled off him in an effort to enjoy the wood. But the more he tried, the more he felt that there was nothing to enjoy. There was the grass, and there were the trees. But what am I to do with them? said John. Next it came into his head that he might perhaps get the old feeling, for what, he thought, had the island ever given him but a feeling, by imagining. He shut his eyes and set his teeth again and made a picture of the island in his mind, but he could not keep his attention on the picture because he wanted all the time to watch some other part of his mind to see if the feeling were beginning. But no feeling began, and then, just as he was opening his eyes, he heard a voice speaking to him. It was quite close at hand, and very sweet, and not at all like the old voice of the wood. When he looked round, he saw what he had never expected, yet he was not surprised. There, in the grass beside him, sat a laughing brown girl of about his own age, and she had no clothes on. "'It was me you wanted,' said the brown girl. "'I am better than your silly islands.' And John rose and caught her in all haste, and committed fornication with her in the wood. 5. Ichabod After that, John was always going to the wood. He did not always have his pleasure of her in the body, though it often ended that way. Sometimes he would talk to her about himself, telling her lies about his courage and his cleverness. All that he told her she remembered, so that on other days she could tell it over to him again. Sometimes even he would go with her through the wood, looking for the sea and the island, but not often. Meanwhile the year went on, and the leaves began to 